going to talk to you or present. So I'm going to bring up my screen and we're going to talk tonight. Okay, so let me do that. Okay, is this right here? All right, so as I said, I'm, not, I'm just gonna present tonight. I'm not going to preach. And tonight I wanna talk to you on the topic, marriage, God's way. And I know some people, when they hear the topic of marriage, they're willing to, are they ready to get out of the Zoom room or are they ready to jump off YouTube? But let's pray before we, before we start. Father, bless this word to our heart tonight. And may you lead us and may as we share this word, may it be a blessing to all those who are here in Jesus' name, amen. Marriage God's way. And they're willing to, are ready to get off or get out of the Zoom room or get off YouTube because they are saying, okay, this presentation is not for me. But, uh, but just hold your horses, just stick with me because the fact is if you're married, this presentation is for you. If you're single, this presentation is for you. If you are divorced or separated, this presentation is for you. If you're a widow, this presentation is for you. And if you're single and looking, this presentation is for you. And if you have the gift of singleness, meaning that for some reason you have decided that you're just going to you know, serve the Lord and share the gospel, I want you to know that this presentation is for you. Because the truth is that anything is written in God's word is for all of God's children. Are, are you with me? If that, if that is true, just say amen in the chat. What is written in God's word is for all of his children. And the fact is that, you know, we need to understand marriage in its biblical light so that we not give a false representation of marriage. Yes, you might have been divorced and, and the fact that somebody might have betrayed your trust and might have hurt you, but it's very important that you hear this message about marriage so that the bitterness and the resentment that you have towards the person that hurt you, you not go out and misrepresent this this sacred institution. Are we together? All right. So, so let's get started. Let's get started. Let the first. I want to share three things with you in this presentation. The first is the biblical foundation of marriage. The second, the benefits of marriage, and then number three, you know, uh, strategies for marital satisfaction. So let's start with a biblical foundation for marriage. The Bible says, then God blessed them and God said, okay, I think I have something back way. So let's, let's do this first. So we're going to read 20, um, Genesis 1, 26 through 28 first. Then God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, male and female, he created them. So there was a transposition right there. Verse 28 says, then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdued it, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so again, we see here that this is a context in which, you know, marriage was given. So firstly, the Bible says God created male and female. Are you following me? And then God blessed them male and female. And God blessed them. And it's very important that we understand that this same blessing here, God, and then God blessed them, is the same blessing that has been placed on the Sabbath. So the first thing I want you to understand is that marriage is 
a spiritual institution. So hear me carefully. Marriage is a spiritual institution and then spiritual things are only spiritually discerned. Are you, are you working with me tonight? So marriage is a spiritual institution and if spiritual things are spiritually discerned and carnal things are only carnally discerned, that simply means that marriage must be entered in with a spiritual mindset. Are you with me? It cannot be that it's the only physical. It's a spiritual institution. And if you want to get the most out of this institution, it must be entered in in a spiritual mindset. God bless them. And, and the thing is that, is that the marriage is the first institution or the home is the first institution. So work with me now, work with me because I'm slowing it down so I can, I can um, sink it in. And so it simply means that, that marriage is before the Sabbath, right? Our marriage is before the church or the home is before the church. So in other words, the church is supposed to be of service to the home. Yes, there is a bi-directional benefit there, but it cannot be that the church is impacting the marriages in, in, in the home negatively. Are you with me? The church is supposed to help to strengthen the primary institution because the reality is if the marriages break down or if the home breaks down, then we won't have a strong church or we won't have any church. Are you, are you, are you following me? And the Bible says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, God says, said to them, have sex. Are you with me? But notice that sex is given in the context of what? Marriage. And you will see that, you know, sex is always in, defined in relationship or is always spoken in connection to marriage. Follow the preacher. I'm going somewhere. So God blessed them and says, be fruitful and multiply. Or have sex. But it's important for un to understand that sex is given in the context of marriage. All right, let's 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 move on. Let's go to our next Bible verse, Genesis two, and we'll be reading from verses. Um, we're reading verses twenty one through twenty four. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. I'm not going to go the general route that we normally say, you know, but the important thing is that he took it from his side, not his head or under his feet. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. So let's take a point here. I want you to, you know, type in the chat. When Adam woke up, who he saw first? Type in the chat. Let our, our type on YouTube. When Adam woke up from this procedure, who he saw first? Come on, come on. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Okay. Eve, okay. Anyone else? Eve, okay. All right, let's 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 get going. Let's go back to when God created Adam. The Bible says God made Adam and then he breathed, right? Into his nostrils, the breath of life, right? So when God getting up, Adam saw him, right? And God had to do the very same for Adam. When he put Adam to sleep, God had to, you know, um, give him back the breath of life, uh, wake him up. And the same thing he did for Eve, he had to breathe in Eve, the breath of life. So, so, so I, I followed the preacher very carefully tonight because it's very important that Adam saw God first. And Eve saw God first before they saw each other. Follow me carefully now. And so it's very important that if you want to understand and, 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 and be able to relate, you know, marriage in the proper context, that simply means that before you can see your partner, the person you're dating, you need to see God first. 
Are you with me? Because he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else that you need will be added unto you. So it's very important if you want to have a, a, a successful relationship or a successful marriage, it's very important that you see God first. Because if you don't, you're going to make some, um, um, some decisions that are only based on the flesh. All right, let me move on. The Bible says, and Adam says, this is no bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So before, you know, as you look at the scripture, the scripture was going in a narrative format, uh, what we call a story format. But in verse 23, the Bible says, and Adam said, in other words, it changes, the language changes from narrative or a story format to poetry. Adam says, this is no bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So in other words, Adam became ecstatic. And the story format could not contain his joy. And so he broke out in poetry. Follow me. Follow me carefully. So the way you feel about your spouse, it should be different from everybody else. Are you with me? Follow, follow me carefully now. The way you feel about your spouse should be different from everybody else. So when you see your wife or when you see your husband, you should have an extra pep in your step. You should have an extra glide in your slide. Are you with me? You should have extra you know, diamonds in your eyes, as it were. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. Then verse 24 says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The man shall leave, or in other words, cut loose from his parents. You know, the, the Hebrew word, therefore, has the connotation of cut loose from parents. Okay. And mother and father and be joined in other words that word is simply means that they are glued together they have now become one yeah i don't know i don't know but if you have glued two pieces of sticks together you know that that becomes no one thing you know maybe i'm not sure if you're using patex or if you're using regular glue or crazy glue but you have now become one and, and generally, when we talk about this one right here, we normally talk about it in the sense of that the marriage is consummated through sex. But I want you to understand that the word there is used for one is the same word that is used in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, meaning oneness. They're now one in purpose. Are you with me? One in mission. They're going in the same direction. So it cannot be, they're also one when it comes to finance. I know some people are dividing bills, you know, um, across financial lines, but that's a dangerous thing. Very dangerous because you're creating division in the relationship because your money should be his money and her money, my money. All right, are you with me? Okay, let, let's uh, let's continue on. Um, the Bible says in in Exodus where we find the ten promises, ten promises or ten principles, which we generally call the ten commandments. You see that the seventh commandment it says, "You shall not commit adultery." Notice that adultery. Are uh, you know what we are talking about right here is sex. All right, follow, follow me. Notice that sex is defined in relationship or is in connection with marriage right here. So, in other words, so in other words, so sex within marriage, okay, is morality. 
according to the Bible. And then sex outside of marriage is immorality. Follow the preacher now. So sex here is defined in relationship to the man. You shall not commit adultery, meaning go outside of the relationship and have sex. So, so again, again, um, sex is defined or is in connection with marriage right here. So any sexual activity outside of marriage is considered adultery or fornication. Are you with me? And so I know that there are other relationships out there. Um, let me put this disclaimer. I should have done it earlier. I know that we have single parent home and we have, uh, you know, uh, siblings household where our older sibling is taking care of younger siblings. And also we have what we call extended family household. That could be a grandparent taking care of grandchildren or that could be aunt taking care of nephews and nieces and so forth. And so I, I just want to make sure we put that out there. But it, it doesn't matter what the household is. We need to understand marriage in its biblical context so that we have good frame of reference and so that when we speak about marriage, we don't undermine the sacred institution. All right, let's move on. The Bible said, follow the preacher again, marriage is honorable among all and the bed is undefiled. In other words, the bed is clean or in other words, what is done are the sexual activity in marriage is clean. But fornicators and adult adulterers, God will judge. I don't know if you see the same thing that I'm working with, that here, you know, marriage, our sex is defined in relation to marriage again. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed is undefiled, meaning that the bed is clean, the sexual activity. But... Those who go outside of that, of that, of that boundary that God has set up are fornicators and adulterers. So let's move, let's continue. The Bible says in Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So I want you to understand that this is the Elijah message. And so just like oh, John the Baptist was the Elijah or what we call the forerunner before, before, you know, before Christ to prepare his way for his first coming. Also, we find out that there would be an Elijah, as it were, a group of people proclaiming a certain message prior to Jesus' you know, second coming. And so here we see that that message is also a family life message. Are you with me? That message is also a family life message. And verse 6 says, And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Because the reality is families will be in shambles before Jesus comes. And that's the reason why Matthew says and you know, that they will be given in marriage and so forth. So it's going to be a family life message because families will be in shambles. Because the reality is the devil is against the family. He is against marriage, which is the foundation of the home. I just want to share this with you. This statement is taken from, you know, Fox's books. Fox's Book of Martyrs by John Fox. And the chapter that this is taken from is the one on the French Revolution. Listen to what it says. The doctrines inculcated in them, meaning the players of the French Revolution, those who were, you know, behind the scenes and those who, you know, um, were, you know, the creators of the French Revolution. The doctrines inculcated in them were subversion of every principle of morality and religion. So in other words, those players behind the French Revolution, their goal was to, you know, um, was to undermine the power and authority of every principle of morality and religion. 
the everlasting distinction between virtue and voice were completely broken down. Does this sound familiar? And they are doing this in modern day in many, many ways. There are lots of philosophical ideas, which I'll just name a couple. For example, one is postmodernism that says there is no big T, no universal truth and morality. There are only some small T's. So the reality is that they say, OK, my truth and your truth. But the reality, friends, if we have truth, we have just proclaimed ourselves gods. And so, but listen now. Marriage was ridiculed, French Revolution. Obedience to parents treated as the most abject slavery, subordination to the civil government, the odious de despotism, and the acknowledgement of God, the height of folly and absurdity. Does this sound familiar? The reality is, if you study history, because the Bible says there is nothing new under the sun, and so God's children need to be students of history. I want you to know that the French Revolution, what happened in the French Revolution is a playbook for the last days. Let me say it in another, in another way for those who, who, who are, you know, who understand research terms. The French Revolution was the pilot study for the last days. So let me let me break that down a little bit. We generally do a pilot study to find out if something is feasible and, you know, so that we can, it's normally a smaller study. And then after we have gathered that information, then we do it on a large scale. So again, the French Revolution playbook for what will happen in the last days or what is happening now. And also it's a pilot study. So again, do you see the subversion of every moral and, and, and you know, subversion of every principle of morality and religion? Do you see that? Do you see that the distinction between vert, virtue, which is morality and vice in morality, uh, you know, do you see that, you know, that is completely broken down, even the church? Do you see that marriage is being ridiculed and cohabitation or, you know, visiting, you know, um, unions are being promoted left, right and center? Okay, let's move on. I'm not going to say any more about that. But in spite of the fact that the devil has set up his emissaries in high places to undermine marriage and to destroy marriage. Listen to this. From Adventist Home, page number one, or page one. The heart of the community. The what? The heart. Meaning the pulse, as it were. Of the community, of the church, and of the nation is the household. So in other words, if the household is sick, that that simply means that the heart of the community is sick. The heart of the church is sick. And marriage plays a very important role in that. The well-being of the society, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depend upon own influences. And so in other words, you will not be able to get a, a, a society that is well and a church that is successful and a nation that is prosperous without happy homes, without homes that are intact. I did not say perfect homes. And so it's very important for us to do that. We need to understand marriage in its proper light and be able to identify the benefits of marriage. Let's talk about the benefits of marriage. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and verse 18, this was when now God had finished everything and Adam named everything. The Bible says, and the Lord God says, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So the question I want to ask you, is that statement still true today? And the Lord God says, it is not good that man should be alone. The reality is that God's word is timeless. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. So God's verdict 
after he created this wonderful world and he created Adam. So God's verdict was this, that is not pleasant. That's what the word means, not good. It's not agreeable and it's not good for the man to be alone. In other words, we could say that it's not healthy for the man to be alone because the fact is, friends, we were created for connection. We were created for what? We were wired for connection. And so the fact that it's not good or not healthy, that the man should be alone, that that simply means that when the man is connected, then there are lots of benefits. Marriage now becomes a protective factor. Let's talk about some of the benefits. Married people have a healthier lifestyle. And when we say married people, it, this is in comparison to all other unions, okay? Or all other, um, you know, family types. Married people have a healthier lifestyle. They have had more harmful behaviors such as much lower levels of smoking and problem drinking of healthier lifestyle in terms of good heating habits and regular exercise. Married people. People who stay married live four to eight years longer than people who don't. Married people have fewer strokes and heart attacks. Let me say it again. Married people have fewer strokes and heart attacks. Married people were 14% more likely to survive an heart attack than those who are not married. Okay, um, married people left the hospital two days sooner after an heart attack than those who were not married. Married people less likely to have advanced cancer at the time of diagnosis. Let me say that again. Married people less likely to have advanced cancer at the time of diagnosis. Married people. Married people more likely to survive cancer for a longer period of time. Married people. Married people survive a major operation more often than those who are not married. Married people. Married people have lower health care costs among older adults. Married people have more satisfying sexual relationships. Uh, so, so, so let me say it again. I'm not even going to say much about this because I know we have children online. Married people have more satisfying sexual relationships. It's sweeter in marriage. Married people are happier. Married people have more wealth and economic assets. So in other words, married households are less likely to live in poverty when compared to other households. A healthy marriage tends to offer more benefits than common law relationships, uh, where we, what we know as cohabitation. So let me say it again. A, a healthy marriage tends to offer more benefits than common law relationships. So in other words, it offers more benefits as it pertains to the stability. It's more stable than common law relationships. Also benefits in terms of physical and mental health of the biological parents and children. So marriage has lots of benefits. Marriage reduces depressive symptoms for both men and women. Children generally do better in two-parent home. So children generally do better in two-parent home. Growing up with married parents is associated with better physical health in adulthood and increased longevity or you live longer. Those are children who grow up with married parents. Children raised in two parents' um, families obtain more education and exhibit healthier behaviors than children from other types of families. 
society benefits when children are raised within a family. So in other words, communities with more married parent families have low rates of substance use are, you know, in Jamaican context, we could say less marijuana use and crime among young people. Let me read that again. Communities with more married people or more married parents have lower rates of substance abuse and crime among their young people. So let's talk about strategies for marital health. How can you sweeten it up? Are you with me? So let's talk about some of those strategies. So the first is that it's, it's good for us to know that happy marriages are not without obstacles. They are marriages where couples use obstacles as opportunities to grow in their relationship. So a happy marriage is not perfect. They have obstacles, but these couples, they use obstacles as opportunities so that they can deepen the connection and they can grow closer to each other. So first thing, if you want to improve your marriage are some of the things that um, contributes to um, some, you know, good marriages. First is to make togetherness a priority. Make togetherness a what? A priority. So your children are not your priority. Your spouse is your Number one priority. The Bible says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And I dare say, what God has joined together, let no children put asunder. So as, as husband and wife, your number one priority is your spouse. Because your spouse is your second self. So... To so make your marriage a priority throughout the marriage. What we know is that 97% of happy couples make togetherness a priority compared to 28% of happy couples. So you see how many? 28% um, of unhappy couples. But 97% of happy couples make togetherness a priority and you can see why they're happy. Make sure friends and family do not interfere with your relationship. And I dare say children as well. Because 81% of happy couples say, um, happy couples say friends and family do not interfere with their relationship. While only 38% of unhappy couples. You can see why they're unhappy. Enjoy spending free time with spouse. 97% of happy couples enjoy spending time with spouse compared to 43% of happy, unhappy couples. So do things together. Take a walk together. You can, you can um, you know, uh, cook together. You can wash dishes together. You know, you can even go to the supermarket together. Go to the park together. Are you with me? Share quality time in great quantity. Notice what I said, quality time. Quality time is not when you're occupied by your device. That is not quality time. So spend quality time. Look into each other's eyes. Couples with higher levels of marital confidence, meaning confidence in their marriage, when they get married are more likely to spend more time together and have higher levels of marital satisfaction, or in other words, they're happier. Couples who spend more time together will report higher levels of marital satisfaction than those who don't spend as much time together. When you don't spend as much time together, you tend to grow apart. And growing apart is the number one reason for divorce, is not infidelity. Infidelity is just a symptom of the fact that you have grown apart. Next one, practice positive communication. Notice I did not say communication because the reality is this will sound 
uh, paradoxical, but the reality is we cannot not communicate because most of communication is nonverbal. So even when you're not speaking, you're communicating. So the emphasis should be on positive communication. So positive communication is where you listen to each other, give each other compliments, avoid blaming. Be, being able to compromise is not your way or the highway. Compromise. Have balanced interactions. Do not dominate each other. Agree to disagree. Invest in your relationship. Invest in your relationship. It's very important that you invest in your relationship. Invest in good books. Attend seminars. Go to a couple's retreat. Are you with me? You know, um, go on a vacation together. Invest in your relationship. It cannot be that you're driving a high-end car and you can't, you know, um, take your wife out or take your husband out. No, it doesn't work that way. It cannot be that you can take your, your car to the mechanic after every three three thousand miles or every three or six months but you don't spend any time uh, you don't invest any money in your relationship it's very important that you invest in a relationship the investment you put in your relationship is what you will get out nurture commitment in your relationship so commitment secures the love when passion burns low Personal, unchanging commitment. Commitment brings longevity to love, is a major source of health of one's um, love. It defines the strength of a marriage. Very, very important. So commitment as a definition is the willingness and determination to work through troubled times. It is characterized by the resolve. To remain in a relationship or persistence. It is a psychological attachment, attachment to the partner and a long-term orientation towards the relationship. So in other words, we are committed that we're in this for the long haul. Are you with me? Marital commitment is a key force underlining the stability, quality, and longevity of the romantic relationship. So what this is saying, if you're not committed to each other, then in your relationship that there won't be any stability, there won't be any quality, there won't be any longevity to your love. Commitment is strengthened in the presence of marital satisfaction, absence of alternative attractions, and steady investment made in the relationship. And generally, when we talk about commitment, you know, this is just what we normally talk about. But I want to share with you that we have two types of commitment. First, we have what we call commitment to the institution of marriage. That's like getting married, you know. But this is where a lot of couples make a big mistake. They say, okay, now I have the man, I have everything. Big mistake. The marriage is just the beginning of your relationship. So you need to have commitment to the institution of marriage. Also, you need to have commitment to the marriage relationship. Because the fact is, it's easier to win than to keep. Winning may take a moment. But keeping takes a lifetime. Put type in the chat that it's easier to win than to keep. So let me see somebody type that in the chat. It's easier to win than to keep. Come on, I'm not seeing anybody typing it. Type in the chat. It's easier to win than to keep. Because the fact is, as I said, winning may take a moment. But keeping or maintaining that relationship is, it takes a lifetime. So next one is, we want to make sure that, you know, sexual intimacy, sexual intimacy. Notice I did not say sex. I said sexual intimacy. Because the truth is, let me put this up first. For men, men are like a microwave. They're ready to zap. Um, a female is like a furnace, takes a long time to warm up. Are you with me? I won't say more about that. Next is that, you know, um, 
the man is like one switch, you know, um, the woman is, you know, a switchboard. Are you with me? So she's thinking about body image. Did he forget the trash again? Children still awake, feeling appreciated and cherished lately. Hormonal changes, conflict with a friend. Is her mother within 100 miles? You name it. So what we need to understand is that for a female, is that emotional intimacy is a vehicle towards sex. But for a male, sex is a vehicle towards emotional intimacy. And so men, men, I'm saying to you that you need to start from in the morning. Send her a text at work, you know, play footsie at the table, you know, tell her how oh, she's looking spankling. And I know you're saying, what's that? In other words, the, the way that she's looking is just so beautiful that you're getting a beating by it. All right, let's uh, move on. The next one is, as we're coming down to a close, you want to pray with and for your spouse. Marriage is under attack, and so it's very important that you pray with and for your, for your spouse. There are a lot of red flag people. They're out to just, um, you know, come down on your relationship. But it's very important because marriage is a spiritual institution. It needs spiritual protection and spiritual reinforcement. So you want to make sure that you pray with and for your spouse and worship together. I'm not sure if you have ever heard the story of John and Ann Bitar. But in 1932, when John and Ann met, met John was just a 25-year-old Syrian refugee and salesman in the seaside town of Connecticut. And Ann was 17. And her father wanted her to marry, marry somebody who was two decades or 20 years older than her. But she couldn't see herself living without John. And so what the couple did, they went to New York and they got married in 19. 32. And if you recall that in the 1930s was the Great Depression. Are you with me? And so they got married in 1932, a time of, you know, economic hardship. But they decided that they were going to stick together. They were in love and they were fond of each other. And I want you to, to know that this couple, they were dubbed the longest married couple in the United States. 86 years of marriage. Yes, they passed away in 2018 and 2019, just before the pandemic. But the fact is that, friends, because of their commitment to each other, and their commitment to God, they were able to spend 86 years together. And so it's possible. We can still have long-lasting marriages. It's possible. We can, marriages still can flourish in the 21st century. It's possible because marriage is a God-ordained institution. The Bible says, therefore, a man shall leave his father or cut loose from his father and mother and be glued or joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Marriage is still God's way. And it's very important that we understand marriage in its proper light, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're divorced, whether you're separated, it doesn't matter. Because it's very important for us to give a good representation of this sacred institution so that we are not misrepresenting God's institution. I do understand that not everyone will get married because some choose not to. And some, because of adverse situations in their relationship, it, you know, broken down. But it's still possible for us to have long and lasting marriages. And my prayer and my goal tonight 
is that this presentation will have would have helped someone to be able to have a, a stronger and a firmer grip on what marriage is from a biblical perspective and know that marriage has lots of health benefits and lots of other benefits, even spiritual benefits. And so my goal and my hope is by God's grace that we will lift up and represent the institution of marriage in the way that God wants us to represent his institution.